Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the fifth edition of Flex in the City. And we're really honoured um, on today's edition to have Mike Tumulty, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Standard Life Aberdeen. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. Thanks a lot. It's nice to be here. Thank you very much. And I've never met you, but I've heard a lot about you from two people who are very close to me. Um, one is my husband and Dave, my business partner, used to service your funds, I believe. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, certainly a small world, that's for sure. It is a small world and we all live in different countries, but it's a very small world, this financial services industry and particularly asset management. So, so I, if, I'd like to kick off, Mike, if that's okay. I'd love to know a little bit about you and your story um, and how you came to be doing the job of Chief Operating Officer at Standard Life Aberdeen. Um, love to hear a little bit more about how that happened. Yeah, so um, so my story um, started uh, with Standard Life some 25 years ago and actually celebrated my 25th uh, work anniversary in September uh, of this year. I went to Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, uh, did mm -hmm. an economics degree and joined Standard Life as a graduate trainee 25 years ago. I spent a couple of years getting to know the business, understand the business, work out what we did as an organization, and then effectively moved into a role looking after our mutual funds operations, which gave me a great insight into how customers interact with an asset manager, what customers expect expected from us as an mm. organization. And then um, after that, I moved into uh, change and became the head of change management for right. Standard Life Investments. Uh -huh. um, that was a fantastic role, which gave me insights of the whole firm from asset management, distribution, mm. fund operations, um, client operations, real estate and tech. Um, so that gave me a completely different perspective on our organization. Uh, and we ran a number of big strategic uh, projects. One was to outsource our back office to, to a global third party service provider. So I was involved in a lot of transformational change. And when I finished that, um, I then, uh, after having outsourced uh, a large component part, was given the job of running what was left of the operations function right? Um, to make sure that the project that ultimately we delivered did actually generate the benefits and realize the synergies that ultimately we expected uh, to get on the back of fundamentally having changed our operating model. In 2010, I was appointed to the board of Standard Life Investments as Director of Operations, mm -hmm. and then uh, served in that role up until 2017, when we merged with Aberdeen Asset Management uh, and became Aberdeen Standard Investments and Standard Life Aberdeen, and was appointed Director of Operations for Aberdeen Standard Investments. Mm -hmm. And then earlier this year, um, was appointed as Global Chief Operating Officer for Standard Life Aberdeen. So I think it's fair to say it's been a pretty um, long, but definitely rewarding, challenging, exciting um, journey. And, and you know, it's um, probably quite, quite rare in this day and age for somebody to have worked 25 years in one organization. But I think it's fair to say that I've seen um, a, fair, you know, a huge amount of change. Yeah. That way, and that's really allowed me to, to grow, develop uh, and, and learn as a professional. Absolutely. And I, I imagine that that change, that that experience in transformation and change um, has set you in good stead for the post-merger um, environment that you're in now. Yeah, certainly. Um, it's, it's a pretty busy, as you can imagine, day on day. But I mm. think the one thing that transformational change does is it, it kind of gets you to think about things in um, sort of bite-sized chunks. And mm. you know, what I'm going to be really clear about is what, is you, what does your end state look like? Uh -huh. the reality of where you are today and then how do you uh, chunk things down to, to get there because you know with the amount of change we have going on it would be easy to become overwhelmed and therefore what mm. you've got to do is draw on that experience as you can say over the last 20 odd years and really try and work out you know how, how best to tackle things is, is really what you know my coping sort of strategy and, uh, and approach. Absolutely. I think Tony Robbins would be very proud of you. He's a big, um, he's passionate about end states. So, um, yeah. So my, in my research, I, I, I always do a little bit of research before these podcasts. And um, I learned from a number of people that your leadership style is rather calm, very rational, 
um, pragmatic um, and, lo and, and logical, and, and that you're also a really nice guy. Um, how has that served you in your career, Mike? Yeah, I mean, I think um, that's very nice uh, to, to hear those attributes be, uh, be, be used. I think, you know, what I would say is that it's, they've served me really well. And I think one of the things that people look for when you're going through the transformational change that we've talked about is for leaders to, to give people a sense of calmness, to mm. ultimately be seen to be dealing with things in a very uh, rational, logical way. I do think it's important that you, you know, clearly are emotionally attached, but, but I think at times you've got to make sure that you keep sort of emotions in check to ultimately mm. uh, approach things in, in, in a pragmatic and inclusive way. Uh, and particularly, you know, when you deal with uh, a merger uh, of two organizations coming together, where clearly, you know, you will have an affinity um, with people because you've worked with them for a long period of time. You'll have an affinity as to how you do things. But actually that ability to be able to stand back and critically evaluate two ways of doing things or, or two, two groups of people, I think is really important. And I think, I think the, nice, the nice bit, you know, it, it's, mm. it's, it's nice to be nice, but I think what's really important is that what you're trying to do as a leader is create the conditions where people feel included. I'm a great believer that where you can create that inclusive environment is that you get diversity and you get diversity of thought, and you, you get diversity of, of beliefs, and you get diversity of, of, of mindsets. And that really is, to my mind, you know, the, the, the position that you're ultimately striving for um, when, you, when you're trying to bring together two organisations. Absolutely, and that's, that's true diversity, isn't it, when you've got diversity of mindsets. Um, so, so, Mai, I understand you've been recently appointed to the Exco, which I'm sure you're very excited about. Um, how do you think in this new role that you can positively influence the current direction of SLA? Yeah, so, so I was appointed in, in March of this year, and I think mm. in some respects, you know, a, a tremendous sort of milestone in, in, in my career, and I think, you know, I'm certainly proud of that, and you know, delighted to be given that, given that opportunity. I think somebody asked me the very question that you, you've asked me, and I guess the, the biggest um, change for me is that being a member of the executive team here at Standard Life Aberdeen is, is acknowledging that corporate responsibility. Mm. Um, you know, I think for, for a period of your career, you know, you're seen as a good functional leader and you're seen as being able to make a difference in the function you lead. And people mm -hmm. will rely on you for technical knowledge, technical expertise. You'll be the go-to person in a specific uh, area where you, you've spent a lot, of, a lot of your time in Korea. Actually, what you're doing at an exec level, uh, an exco, is really bringing yourself to the party, not only as a, a functional leader, but also a corporate leader. Yeah. And therefore, um, making sure that you, know, you do take the time to understand you know, where, where the focus is from asset management on the investment mm. side of things, the distribution strategy, you know, ultimately, you know, what's happening with the finances, because that's such an important part of, of running a successful business, understanding what our people's strategy is. So I think the biggest thing that I've, I've, I've learned and I think I've tried to prepare myself for is becoming a corporate leader um, who has absolutely functional expertise and experience but how do you then leverage that to um, ultimately bring that to a, to, to a corporate perspective? Yeah, so, so what you're really talking about is, is having that vision and, and acting like a statesman um, in, in some ways. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's what, you know, ultimately, you know, people, people are looking for, that you know, you know, the firm's strategy um, inside out. You're, you're not on the hoop for delivering the entirety of it because that is ultimately, you know, how mm. the team breaks down the tasks, the responsibilities and the activities, but you definitely, in that uh, statesman type role, have to understand the direction of travel, how it all joins up, how it connects, how then you translate that to the area which you have responsibility for. Yeah, absolutely. So, so moving on a little bit, if I may, um, Mike, to, to perhaps the personal side of your um, life, we, we, we're aware that you're very passionate about football, um, having been a Scottish Premier League referee for many years and, and you're actually the second Flex in the City 
uh, leader who's a big football fan and we've already learned how financial services can learn an awful lot from from sports like football so so I'm really curious to know how it was giving red cards to very famous footballers and, and you know was this a different kind of, of, of leadership Mike and, and um, what are the skills that you learned there that you bring into Standard Life Aberdeen today? Yeah so I mean you're you know, you're spot on. I mean, I, I was really fortunate enough to have refereed uh, at top level in Scottish football for, for about 10 years. Refereed, I think, north of 65 Premier League games. And again, served a long apprenticeship, you know, in terms of starting out my refereeing career in Scotland in 1994, um, top level by 2003, and then 10 really good years of, of enjoying that. I guess for me, what's interesting about the, the red card thing is that as a referee, it's probably one of the worst moments in the game where ultimately you have to issue a red card because, it, because as a referee, what you're really trying to do is facilitate um, 22 players on a pitch to try and have a really good game of football. Uh, and my style uh, as a referee was to try and cajole, encourage, prompt uh, mm. players to try and play within the spirit of the laws of the game. But one thing, and I think it's the same, you know, and there are many parallels between the business world and the sports world, but, but there's a set of rules. Um, you know, we have to operate within rules in the business world. Mm. Uh, and, and within football, there, there are set of rules. And if somebody compromises the integrity of the rules, um, then unfortunately, you're left in a position whereby you've got no choice, but in some instances, to show, to show a red card. And I think, you know, what that then does is, is it kind of depersonalizes it. And actually, mm. it, it kind of makes it very much, you know, I hate to say it, but, but almost a process that ultimately um, you've got to follow. And, and you know, and, and I refereed at some big games in front of some pretty uh, intimidating crowds. Mm. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you, you know that you're going to have to make tough decisions. But, but what allows you to make those tough decisions is knowing that there are a set of rules that need to be, um, it's going to sound really quite boring, but comply with. And, and ultimately, if there's not compliance, then, then you've got to have the courage and the convictions to be able to, to deal with the situation uh, that ultimately um, is, is brought about by that. So as I say, my, my style was to be, you know, one of a facilitator to try and encourage a really good game of football. Um, I would talk to players, try and, try and encourage them, just try and, you know, have a little bit of banter to try and, ultimately get them on side to, to really operate within within the laws of the game. But there's a line that ultimately if somebody crosses, then ultimately you, you've kind of got to deal with that and, and, and there've got to be um, consequences. Absolutely. Have you had to get some red cards out in business too? <laughs> I, try, I try and avoid showing people red cards in business, but I think, um, you know, in terms of the skills that I think ultimately you, you can apply. I think, you know, sometimes in, in the business world, we can become almost paralyzed by analysis. And I think mm. we want to think about things, we want a little bit more time to think about things, we want more data, we want more. And what's really interesting, I say, with, with referee, and it's about basically getting yourself in the position to almost have a clear and unobstructed view so that you, you can make a decision you can tell with confidence. And I think in the business world, what I talk about with you know, some of our uh, younger leaders who come to our organization is, is don't drown yourself in data and don't drown yourself trying to analyze information. Get to the point where you've got all the available information you need and then, and then you know, make a recommendation, make the decision. Mm. Um, and we're not, you know, thankfully, uh, in our organization doing open heart surgery. We're actually yeah. making decisions where you know, the, the consequences of getting something wrong are not catastrophic. So, so you can make decisions. If the decision's not right, uh, ultimately, you can reverse them and you can learn from it. And I guess, you know, the other thing, certainly with refereeing, I think it's important that you give decisions with confidence. I think leadership is all about trying to inspire mm -hmm. uh, people to, to do the best that they can possibly do. And, and, you know, clearly, you know, making decisions and how you sell a decision, both in refereeing and the business world, and can inspire people with confidence and give people that um, ability to, to, you know, see things through and, and, and ultimately do what you need to do. Fantastic. So the last 
football fan on Flex in the City was Ian Holden and his favourite leader or, or the leader in, in the football manager that he felt was, was, was the best was Pep Guardiola. What's your view? Who's, who's your uh, football manager you find a great leader? Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm going to be uh, diametrically opposed to, to, to Ian in terms of my selection because I'm going to go with Sir Alex Ferguson. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, so that maybe gives a little bit of uh, clues to uh, um, which club um, I, I have a uh, relation to. Um, yeah. But also I attended um, one of Sir Alex Ferguson's talks in Glasgow uh, mm. called Feeding where Nicky Campbell uh, interviewed Sir Alex Ferguson for well over an hour. And I think the reason that I cite Sir Alex and I think the things that I took away from his talk were no one person is bigger than the club. Uh, the team is, is ultimately everything. And mm -hmm. that's not just the 11 players who start the game at 3 o'clock on a Saturday, but it's the subs coaching staff, the backroom staff. He talked about knowing the names of the ladies who served him his food at Carrington uh, at the training centre, which is where Manchester United train. He talked about being in their lottery syndicate and he talked about the fact that he hadn't been there for a few months and when he arrived, they called him out on the fact that actually he hadn't paid what he was due for a lottery <laughs> syndicate. Um, and, and I think what he did was bring a massive amount of humility to, mm. to that room and made you think about actually, for everybody who works in our organization, there are lots of unsung heroes who ultimately make sure that each and every day the organization mm. does what it needs to do. And I, and I think you know, he, he, he demonstrated that. And I think the other thing is, you know, and it's, and it's a, an old cliche, but there's no I, there's no I in the team. Yeah. And I think, you know, the evidence would suggest that he was not afraid to potentially move on some of the superstars at uh, Manchester United because ultimately they, they either didn't want to be there or they didn't want to be part of the team. And I think, you know, working in asset management, but particularly in an asset manager um, which is very much focused on team as opposed to necessarily... Um, staff or managers. There's a lot of parallels there in terms yeah. of making sure that you've got a cohesive team who are really clear on the purpose of the organisation, the strategic drivers for the organisation, and ultimately the behaviours which align mm. to to the purpose. And I think when I read his book, and I think he wrote that in conjunction with um, Harvard Business School, uh -huh. uh, it's a really good read um, and, and the ability to take away some really simple and small things that can that can make a massive difference and, and you know to have effectively I think rebuilt the teams at Manchester United at least three or four times over 26 years is tantamount to somebody who recognizes the need to invest in talent and to nurture talent mm. but also not be afraid to call time on people at the club for, for a period of time. It's a brave thing to do, but ultimately it's essential to make sure that you've got that lifeblood running through the club, but also the organisation. Absolutely. Well, I think my husband would certainly concur with your, your choice of Sir Alex mm -hmm. Ferguson, very much so. In your career, Mike, I'm, I'm sure you'll have reported to a lot of people, who, who was the most inspiring for you over the years and, and, and why? Yes, yeah, so I think it's a couple of, couple of um, individuals. So I think, firstly, when I looked after sort of mutual funds operations, um, I reported to the managing director of mutual funds operations, a guy called Alan Burton. Uh, mm -hmm. And Alan, back in the day, was um, the chair of uh, Audit, the old association of unit trust investment funds. Mm -hmm. It well have been the first chair of the, the newly formed Investment Managers Association. And I think he, he taught me a really important lesson in life, particularly in asset management. And that was, if you deliver poor investment performance and poor client service, you'll always lose a client. But if you deliver for a period of time, because obviously all, all fund managers, they have their ups and the downs, but if you deliver poor investment performance, but your client service is exceptional, you stand a chance of retaining the client 
for the investment performance returns. And I think what Alan did was teach me very early in my career the importance of exceptional client service. And ultimately that without that, you will always lose the clients because they'll get fed up, they'll get frustrated. And I think one of the things that I've tried to adopt um, the mentality of is no matter who I deal with, is my uh, perspective in life. And then I think the, the second person who um, you know, I, I reported to briefly before he retired from Standard Life was Sir Sandy Crombie. And Sir Sandy Crombie effectively led Standard Life between 2003 and 2009. But led Standard Life through a really important uh, part of its history and journey, which was the demutualization of Standard Life and the flotation on the UK uh-huh. top market in 2006. And, and for a lot of people who've liked in Standard Life and had only ever known what, what being a mutual was like, what Sandy, what Sandy did was made people, um, you know, not afraid of becoming a PLC, you know, in the UK with flotation. And I think he did that, um, you know, in a, in a way which explained to people why we had to become a PLC. He didn't sugarcoat it, he didn't um, flinch. And he also explained, you know, why we needed to get really fit as an organisation as we headed into that IPO uh, to float in the UK stock market. So that effectively, the, the IPO was was almost just the end of the beginning. Mm-hmm. Uh, and effectively, he looked beyond the IPO and, and did a number of things to think about, you know, what, what the business needed to look like beyond the IPO, because it would have been really easy for everybody because becoming a PLC from, from being a mutual, it's a massive undertaking. Yeah. And I think it would have been really easy for everybody in the organization to be fixated by the tasks and the activities associated with the mutualization and not think about the future. And I think, you know, I draw a parallel and I've definitely learned from watching him and observing him when he was our CEO about if you get lost in the, in the, the myriad of the detail that you live with today, you, you may not end up in a, you may not get where you want to be. And mm-hmm. therefore, you know, your, your comment about Tony Robbins, I think is, is spot on effectively is be really clear about what the destination is. And then ultimately, you know, work from your current reality, but don't lose sight of that destination. And I think he, he, he brought that um, to our organization in space. And interestingly, you know, um, I still catch him periodically, but he then became the senior independent director uh-huh. at the Royal Bank of Scotland uh, at a time when the Royal Bank of Scotland clearly through the global financial crisis mm. an organisation that went through a significant amount of transformational change and I couldn't have probably uh, envisaged a better individual in terms of preparedness for such an important role for, for one of the UK's you know, um, one of the largest financial institutions in the UK mm-hmm. so there's a couple of people I think that I look at and certainly you know, have admired their style, taking the best bits and then kind of making your own because I think what you've got to make sure is that, and I talked to some young leaders actually today who were going through our new managers program mm-hmm. uh, and, and said, you know, you shouldn't really aspire to be anybody, but what you should try and do is look at the practices that people who inspire you um, do and then think about how you can make those practices your practices um, if they're applicable to what you do and how you do it. Um, because because you are you at the end of the day, and you need to be authentic. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Authenticity is key, isn't it, in, in leadership? So, so Mike, you've travelled awful lot, I guess, with Standard Life Aberdeen, you know, all across the world, um, and you've had to adapt your own leadership style to different cultures across the world. So in this post-merger environment um, at Standard Life Aberdeen and where there's this need to bring two very different cultures together, how has that global experience of, of travelling served to help your own thinking? Yes, I mean, uh, you know, I think one of the, the fantastic parts of my, my career has been, um, I've had the opportunity, you know, which I'm extremely grateful for, to have visited you know, many, many countries, whether it's been India, looking at technology or business process outsourcing, whether it's been helping to try and build a successful um, franchise in, in the US, 
with a lot of time spent in Boston, you know, looking at how we distribute our funds and how do we build operating models. And likewise in Asia, where we effectively have a footprint in, in 10 countries. And I guess what I would say is what I've always tried to do is, you know, take time to understand a little bit about the culture where I'm going to, uh, understand, you know, the bit about the working conditions because they're different across the globe and ultimately try and understand a little bit about the working practices and very much kind of take away a small number of things that you think about and that ultimately you can potentially use or replicate, but certainly you put into your mindset. Mm. Um, one of the things you've seen that ultimately would allow you to reflect on doing things in a, in, in a different way. And also, you know, we've even been involved actually with, with David, your business partner, uh, in some some early you know business courses outsourcing and rather than simply go and think about sort of you know well, if we give them this instruction then they can they can process it actually think about how could you change what you do in order to make that end to end process far more effective than than it necessarily is to do so I think what I what I've tried to do is definitely go wherever I've gone very much with an open mind and then think about how do I take snippets, the best bits of what I've seen, and ultimately try and leverage that or change things mm -hmm. to, to make it easier for us, certainly in the operational space, to deal with business process outsourcing partners or captives or, or some of the larger organizations we've dealt with in, in a far more effective way. And, and I think culturally, having visited a lot of different places, understood, you know, how, how things are done, the values that those organizations have, is very much then bring that and say, okay, in a merger, where are people coming from? You know, what, what's the backstory? What's the history? Yeah. How did they get to where they've got to today? And I think, you know, I always think history is really important to help you almost establish your starting point, but also try and establish a common language. And, yeah. and then you can move forward from there. So, so I'm a great believer that, um, the travel and, and the cultural things that I've been able to observe and see have allowed me to understand how things have got to where they've got to. And that mindset has then been applied mm. to some of the business challenges that, that I've faced as a leader. And as, as you know and are experiencing yourself at Standard Life Aberdeen, that, that the whole of the asset management industry is, is really being challenged by digitalization. So, so what are your thoughts about the future of asset management and what skills do you think are needed by leaders um, in asset management now and in the future? So I definitely absolutely agree. I mean, I think, you know, digital is, is sort of everywhere and it's almost everything. And I think, you know, there are none of us in our personal lives, and, and not the you know, if there are any who they are, who are not kind of digitally enabled because, you know, ultimately what was a mobile, mobile phone 10, 15 years ago is, is now ultimately how effectively you run, you know, most of your life. So, so asset management, I think, is is ultimately, you know, going to be challenged. Digital, I think, you can you can we can look at its adoption in a number of different ways. How do you speed up the investment research process? Mm -hmm. You can have digital capabilities and technology. And uh, so, how do you leverage digital technology to make better investment decisions? How do we ultimately provide information? Uh, in a far more digital way. You know, in days gone by, we would have produced paper-based client reports. Actually, what clients want is uh, real-time access to information which pertains to their investments. And we've got to work out how we provide that in a, in a digital way, as opposed to, you know, effectively uh, paper. How we, you know, provide customer service, chatbots, you know, how we effectively respond to customers and their requests real-time. So I think, you know, there are a number of different ways. So I think one of the things that ultimately um, anybody entering the work in world today is probably going to be far more um, technology literate. Um, and I don't mean coding and developing code, but I do mean, you know, that, that ability to effectively work out how to enable things in a, in a smarter, quicker way by tech is going to be pretty important for financial services leaders in the future. And I'm encouraged, you know, I actually spent a bit of time as a governor at Harry Watt University. You know, I do that five, six times a year. 
uh, in that governance role. And what's quite interesting is the extent to which a lot of courses now at universities are being taught in a way which lend themselves to the working world. And therefore, they're far more pragmatic and practical. Yeah. Uh, and, and they talk about career pathways coming off a lot of university courses. And that's a yeah. very different language than when I graduated and, and went through the mill crown some 25 years ago. Uh, so I think people who are graduating from university are definitely coming out now, I think, with the skills, which means that their degrees and their processes and the discipline they follow will lend themselves to financial services and other industries like uh, financial services probably far more effectively than, than we may have done historically. Very good. So I've got a couple of fun questions to close our interview for today, Mike, if you're happy to have a little bit of a giggle. So yeah. the, first, the first question, the easy one, I think, is, is what gets you out of bed every morning and, and what are your core values? Yes, yeah, so I think what, what, what definitely gets me out of bed is that um, no one can make a difference. I think ultimately at the end of the day, it's really important. We spend a lot of time at work and I think what you've got to make sure that you can do is, is feel like that you can make a difference. Um, and if you can make a difference, you know, that motivates you, it, it makes you feel better about yourself. And I heard a little adage recently uh, from somebody I was talking to, and I thought it's kind of stuck with me a little bit, which is try and do something better today than you did yesterday, and try and do something better tomorrow than you did today. And it could be anything. It yeah. could be absolutely anything. You know, I've been doing a bit of running, and it could be, well, I want to I want to take, you know, 15 seconds off my 5K or my 10K or whatever distance that ultimately people run. So it can be personal. Or actually, you know, at work it can be, I've got a really important um, project coming up or I've got a really important board paper coming up that I need to work on. And I want to make that, make sure this board paper is better than the last board paper I've submitted. So for me, it's about making a difference and trying to ultimately continually improve what it is that, that, that you do. And in terms of my core, core values, I think for me, you know, it's, it's very much about um, openness, honesty, transparency, and, and really trying to develop people to ultimately, which sounds, you know, a bit, a bit sort of, well, than apple pie, but ultimately to be, to be better than, you know, to, to be as good as they want to be. Effectively, I think mm. it's something that motivates me. Very good. I love what you're saying about incrementalism. I, I, I read a lot um, recently about the British cycling team that came right yeah. from the back yeah. to the front through their rigorous approach to, to incrementalism. So that really resonates what you're saying there. So I've now got the most difficult question for you, Mike, the most difficult question of the whole, whole podcast. And that is the following. So think very carefully. If you could referee a dream game, which teams would it be and why? Yeah, so I mean, I'll probably give it away. So it's got to be, it's got to be Manchester United. Uh, it's got to be Old Trafford. Um, I've visited <laughs> as a fan many, many times. I think the opponents would have to be Real Madrid. Um, mm. So I think the Galacticos <laughs> from, from Madrid, I think, you know, obviously they have won European Cup, Champions League more than any other team. And I think just having been at a Manchester United Real Madrid Champions League game, when the result didn't quite go the way uh -huh. we had hoped um, to ultimately um, be involved in a game of that profile, such a, a football spectacle would, would, would uh, be fantastic. So Manchester United versus Real Madrid in, in, in the Champions League game would be definitely, um, would have been, had I done it, the, the, the highlight of my, my refereeing career. As it was, um, I must admit, I was fortunate enough to be um, the fourth official in the Champions League at the Allianz between Bayern Munich and uh, I think it was Maccabi Haifa from uh, Israel, or it may have been Hapoel Tel Aviv, but it was one of the Israeli teams we'll, we'll have to do, but that, that wasn't bad either, to be honest. Very good. Well, I know that there are going to be some listeners who will be very, very jealous. Mike, thank you very much for being our guest on Flex in the City. You've been absolutely fantastic, very authentic, and I think there are lots of people that can learn from everything that you said. So thank you, Mike Tumulty, for being on Refereeing a Merger on Flex in the City. Thank you.